If you'll open your Bibles with me for this period of study to Acts chapter 26, we're going to begin and end the lesson with one particular verse in this good chapter. Paul loved to tell the story of Jesus. And if you put him on the spot, he would tell you why he ever started telling that story. Well, that's what had happened here again as he's on his way finally to, to being in Rome. A Roman citizen who wanted a fair shake about the way that he had been treated only for preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 26, he tells the folks who are listening that he at one time was confronted by Jesus himself, but that happened after Jesus had already been crucified by the Roman authorities. Paul was on his way to Damascus with letters from the high priest that he might apprehend anybody in that town who was following the way the way of Christ. But on his way, Christ confronted him. Paul had no idea what was going on. A voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? A voice that was accompanied by a light that finally left him blind. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he said. And before this chapter is over, Paul says that the reason that he could be confronted by Christ is because he was crucified, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And so his crucifixion was not an unmitigated tragedy. It was, in fact, God's strategy for saving people from sins. The resurrection was the assurance of that all. Jesus wanted Saul to go to the people who had not yet been reached by and large by the gospel. It was getting out there among the Jews, but the Gentiles, like us, need the good news as much as anybody. And so as Jesus is saying what this is all about, he told Saul, as Saul says in verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus is alive with good news, and he wanted Paul to preach it. He wants us to hear it, and he wants us to share it. We'll be coming right back there at the end of the lesson tonight. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel guilty? Have you ever felt guilty? If you feel guilty right now, is that good or bad? Or if you've ever felt guilty, is that good or bad? Well, as we examine Scripture, the answer is it depends. It depends on why you feel guilty. Paul's talking here, and Jesus was talking to Paul about forgiveness of sins, an escape from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and about sanctification and a place among all those people whom God has set apart. Let's think for a moment about God and your sin. And as we do that, turn with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. We're in the middle here of a night, it would seem to me, full of all kinds of emotions for the people who had been following Jesus around so closely for three and a half years. Jesus knows what's going to happen the next day. They don't so much understand yet, but Jesus has said enough that they think this is all about to end in, in some way. And he'd been telling them about it. And maybe they're starting to understand. Maybe they're starting to feel the full weight of it, but their hearts are troubled. 
Jesus acknowledged that in John chapter 14, and, and don't let it be that way. And he started telling them assuring things, and one assuring thing after another, after another, after another. Well, indeed, he was going to go away. He's going to go back to, to heaven, but his apostles weren't going to be left alone. The Holy Spirit was going to be sent for their special benefit. And here's what Jesus says in, in John chapter 16. Let's join him in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. He'll glorify me, for he'll take what's mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, if the disciples understood anything yet about the commission they were going to get and the plan Jesus had for them in all the world, well, that would have had to be overwhelming to think about the responsibility he was giving them. But he told them, you're going to have help. Not just any help. I'm sending the helper. I'm sending the spirit of truth. And he is going to guide you into all the truth. He's going to remind you of what I've said to you. But he talks about a, a particular role that the Holy Spirit plays in God's plan. And he plays the role of one who convicts. He will be one who convicts. Verse 8, he'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. If you're not in Christ, how does God want you to feel about your sin? Let's join the apostles after the Holy Spirit has been sent to convict the world, giving them the truth that people needed to hear. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, we hear a response from people who were hearing the message of Jesus from Peter and the rest of the apostles for the first time on the day of Pentecost. They preached Jesus. They told about the kind of life he led. They reminded the people there of the death that he died, but then told them what they didn't understand and what they didn't know, that God raised him from the dead and has made him both Lord and Christ, verse 36. But Peter had introduced his sermon with a quotation from Joel, and that quotation ends in verse 21 whenever he says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, the conviction to which Peter led these people is found in verse 36. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You crucified Jesus. Now, I doubt that any of the Roman soldiers who drove the nails and erected the cross were in that audience. They might have been. Might there have been chief priests? Might there have been members of the Sanhedrin? Might there have been Pharisees? Might there have been scribes? 
It seems for certain if Peter's going to say this so directly, this Jesus whom you crucified, there were people there who seven weeks earlier had stood there when Pilate was saying, what do I do with Jesus of Nazareth who were among those who cried out, crucify him, crucify him, because they'd been stirred into that frenzy by all of those Jewish leaders who opposed Jesus, who felt so threatened by him. Maybe that wasn't the first time that they had been there during a Passover weekend and had been there uh, saying, yeah, here's the person you ought to crucify. But it had never been anybody like Jesus because there's never been anybody like Jesus. It never will be again. But they realize now we're complicit. We crucified him. Well, how did that realization strike them? Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And some of our older translations say they were pricked in their heart. And that's good translation, I suppose. But it doesn't suggest to us the same as some other translations. I have my finger pricked sometimes. And I'll bleed a little bit, but it, it doesn't really hurt. And so there's a different connotation to that word for us. I read they were cut to the heart. I was listening Thursday to a sermon that Jason didn't preach here, but a really good one from Acts chapter 2. And as he went through what the theological Greek dictionary say, there's a word here that communicates it perhaps better than any other. They were stabbed in the heart. And what was it that was stabbing them in the heart when they heard this? It was guilt, wasn't it? God's made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. They felt awful. And that was good. Because that's exactly how God wanted them to feel for that. Jesus said, I'll send the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you into all the truth. Peter said, God's made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. They were convicted by the Holy Spirit through the words that the apostles preached. They felt it very very deeply. And that was good. Because they didn't like feeling that way. And so they asked, what shall we do? And Peter replied in verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why was it good for them to feel guilty? Because it could lead to their forgiveness. And for 3,000 people that day, it did. Peter continued to encourage them, exhort them, warn them with many other words. And verse 41 says, They then that gladly received his word were baptized. And there were added to their number that day about 3,000 souls. How glad they must have been when they heard that they could be forgiven of that awful thing they had done. God wants us to feel forgiven when we've been forgiven. And he wants us to function in the joy that comes for forgiveness. God wants to lead us out of the practice of sin and finally to a place where there is no sin, where only righteousness dwells, as Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3. So if you feel guilty and you haven't been forgiven, it's a good thing you feel guilty. God wants you to feel guilty. And he wants to offer you to forgiveness. And when he's given it to you, he doesn't want you to feel guilty anymore. 
but somebody else wants you to feel guilty. Satan wants you to feel guilty still after you've been forgiven. You remember where we start in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, God wanted to bring people out from under the power of Satan to God. Now, what is Satan's power? Satan's power, more than anything, is persuasion. And he never wants to get anybody to believe anything but a lie. According to Jesus in, in uh, John chapter 8, verse 44, he's a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning, and he really can't do anything else but lie. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, calls him the deceiver of the whole world. <coughs> Excuse me, time out. Now, <clears throat> what would Satan like you <clears throat> to believe? <clears throat> what would Satan like you to believe before you are forgiven? <clears throat> before you are a Christian? I don't expect the rest of this lesson to be really long, but <clears throat> I'd kind of like you to add to this list that I'm going to give you. In your mind... What would he like you to believe? <clears throat> Satan would like you to believe, for one, that you cannot be forgiven. You've done something so bad, you cannot be forgiven. You've been doing it for so long, you cannot be forgiven. You're just following in your dad's steps or your, your grandfather's steps. This has been going on in your family for so long, you're going to keep doing it. You cannot be forgiven. Satan would love for you to believe that. What else might he want you to believe before you're a Christian, before you're forgiven? Well, differently than, than that last thing, he might want you to believe that you don't need to be forgiven. And so especially these days, he'll help you to redefine your sin. And so many things that are labeled by certain words in the Bible have new words to label them today so that they don't sound like the old bad things that we used to know them to be. We know what a shift there's been in our culture, and I'm not going to catalog it now. But he would love for you to think that you don't even need to be forgiven. There's nothing wrong with the things you do that the Bible says are sinful. Or if you haven't been forgiven, he might just want you to be to believe that you're already forgiven. That's the way Satan would work, especially <clears throat> out of all the denominational teaching that we're aware of about sin and salvation. He might be some you might be someone whom he'd just want to believe you were saved by faith alone. Satan loves it for, for people to think, I'm a Christian, I'm right with God, to be really happy about it all through life when they've been taught to believe a lie about salvation. All those kinds of things would be great with Satan. What about after you're forgiven? And, and I'd like you to keep thinking about that list and, and adding to it. What would he like people to believe before they're forgiven? What about after you're forgiven? What if you had been one of those very people who obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? You did that so excitedly. It was great to be a part of this brand new church, the way it's described in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. But after the new war off, what would Satan have loved for you to believe? And what would he love for you to believe today if you are a Christian? He would love for you to believe that you can keep on making sin your habit. Now, we confess, we acknowledge that we are weak. And we don't always get it right, even after we're forgiven. 
But Satan would go right along with those people who were questioning Paul about grace and faith in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, when he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. God forbid. We who died to sin, how shall we live in it any longer? Now, I'm still going to fail sometimes, but sin, if I'm forgiven, ought not to be my devotion anymore. That belongs to the Lord. But Satan would love for you to believe that God's grace is a license for you to do whatever you want to do. Satan would just love for you to believe that and not feel guilty. Another thing that Satan might want you to believe, that I know he'd love for you to believe, after you have been forgiven, is that you haven't really been forgiven. You've still got to live with it. you still got to live with the guilt and consequences beyond measure. But God says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Now, in, in, in those two lists, I, I've named two things <clears throat> that you could call bad guilt. One, if Satan convinces you before you've you're forgiven that it just can't happen. You cannot be forgiven. You are, you're too awful. That's a bad kind of guilt. That's not going anywhere good. But then this last point that we made, you haven't really been forgiven. God didn't do what the Bible says he does whenever you repent and are baptized. God's not faithful and righteous to forgive your sins as you confess them and walk in the light. 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9. Satan would love for you to believe those things. Bad guilt can rob you of the joy of your forgiveness. God and Satan and your sin. Satan would love to divert you from ever coming to Christ. And he would love to discourage you from being a faithful servant of Christ. Would you go back to Acts chapter 26, verse 18 with me as we close? Let's remember what God wants and what God promises, what God does. Jesus told Saul, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's God's plan. That's God's promise. That's God's power. A couple of hours ago after we were home from camp, I was sitting in a chair thinking about this lesson, struggling to stay awake like some of you have been in regard to this lesson. But sitting there in a, in a recliner under a really bright lamp, and at the times I would wake up, I would think, man, that lamp is, is making me so hot. That's what happens when you sit under a lamp, right? Well, it used to be that way, but this is an LED bulb. And I just... I mean, I knew the truth, but I had to reach up there and find out, yeah, I can touch that. I can grip that bulb right now that's shining right here on me. You see, Satan wants you to think you got to feel the heat, even when you're already in Christ. But what God's doing is just providing light for you. He wants you to turn from Satan's power to his, from darkness to light. He wants you to have forgiveness in a place among all those who are sanctified. Are you walking in his light tonight? If you're not, why not get started the way Peter told people to in Acts chapter 2? If you're a Christian, 
Be reminded, 1 John chapter 1 says that if you walk in the light, confess your sins to God. He's faithful and just to forgive you of all love. But the blood of Christ will keep you clean. There might be something you'd want to confess to us tonight because it helps sometimes for other people to know that, that you're having a hard time with it. We'd be glad to pray for you for that reason or, or any spiritual reason tonight. We come while we stand and sing together.